All right, so the situation that is presented here on this problem is we need to find with this function where it is concave up or concave down and also find any points of inflection. In order to do that, we're going to have to go through and incorporate the second derivative. So take my first derivative and be 4x cubed minus 12x. And now move on to my second derivative. Second derivative would be 12x squared minus 12. By finding the second derivative, what we can now do, which is real similar to finding critical numbers um, with a first derivative when we're looking at increasing and decreasing intervals, we can take our second derivative, we can set it equal to 0. And if we solve for x here, now let's see, we can factor out a 12, we're left with x squared minus 1 equals 0. Basically, 12 is going to divide out since there's not an x attached. The uh, x squared minus 1 that remains, we could say x squared equals 1. Take the square root of each side. Don't forget it's plus or minus. Uh, square root of 1 would be 1 then. So again, when we're taking a first derivative, these would be known as critical numbers. Here, uh, with the second derivative and ultimately trying to find uh, the concavity with the graph, we're just using these values to assist us in setting up our intervals on our chart. So now if we go to the chart, we set up an x column, we set up a second derivative column, a column for our function, and then a column for any inflection points we may have. As we set up our intervals, we start at negative infinity. We work our way up to the smaller of the values we just found when the second derivative equaled 0, so negative 1. We stop at negative 1, go from negative 1 on up to 1, stop at 1, then go 1 to infinity. As far as what's going on in this second derivative column, we know when x is negative 1 and when x is 1, the second derivative would equal 0, since after all, that's how we found 1 over here in the first place when we set the second derivative equal to 0. With regards to our intervals now and what's happening with the second derivative, we need to pick values on these intervals. We need to plug in to the second derivative, so back here. And we need to see what kind of sign result we get back on our answers. So if I pick something on the first interval that's less than negative 1, say negative 2, if I plug that into the second derivative, what I should find is I get a positive result. Uh, when I plug in a number from negative 1 to 1, say 0, if I plug that into the second derivative, I should notice that I get a negative result back. And when I take something on that final interval from 1 to infinity, so something greater than 1, say 2, if I plug that in, I should get a positive result once again. And what that tells me about the original function is it tells me that it is concave up for the first interval and for the last interval because that's where I got positive results for the second derivative. Um, as far as that middle interval is concerned, if I was looking at the original function of the graph, I would notice that from negative 1 to 1, it's concave down. As for the inflection point idea, well, the inflection point idea, we go back to these x values we found originally of negative 1 and 1, and we decide if these points need to be noted in the final column as inflection points. Well, recall, inflection points occur where there's a change in concavity. So around negative 1 here, you'll notice that we did go from concave up to concave down. And also around 1, we went from concave down to concave up. So at both negative 1 and 1, we will have inflection points. To find those points, well, understand that this last column, actually the last two columns, are devoted to the original function. So we take these values and we plug back into the original function to figure out what our inflection points are. So in this case, on this problem, if we plug back into the original function, we should get negative 2 back for both negative 1 and 1 being plugged in. So 
So this chart here provides a summary in which we can decipher what's going on with the original function. We could see if we graphed it out where it's concave up, it's concave down, and we could see where the concavity is changing at these inflection points. All right now if we move on to a similar example here, same sort of directions. All right, with this one, we got a little more work involved to take our derivative. So if we start with the first derivative, knowing ultimately we need to get to a second derivative here. If you take the first derivative, you have a quotient. So if we follow the quotient rule, we start with the derivative of the numerator, which is 1, times the denominator. We subtract the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. So here, we'd have a chain rule. We'd bring down the 2. We would multiply on the quantity 1 plus x. Now, technically raised to the first power if we subtract 1 away. Also, we would technically divide by the derivative of 1 plus x, which is 1, and tack that onto the end. All of that would be the derivative of the denominator. Finishing off the quotient rule, we would take our denominator which is currently squared, and square that again to follow the quotient rule. So now that power is going to be 4. If we start to clean things up in the numerator. Now let's see. First I would start with the expansion of the binomial right here. If I expand that out, understand it's 1 plus x times 1 plus x. That would give me 1 plus 2x plus x squared. As for the rest of it that we're subtracting here, you might notice that we have a 2x here that we could distribute through. And since we have a power of 1 on this quantity, that is allowed. As we distribute that through, might as well carry the negative also. If we carry the negative 2x through, we get negative 2x. Uh, that would be minus 2x squared. So this is all going to be over. 1 plus x raised to a power of 4. Join in some like terms now. Let's see, we're going to start with a 1. The 2 x's will cancel. And as far as the x squareds are concerned, we're going to have a minus x squared that remains. This is all over a quantity of 1 plus x raised to a power of 4. So there is your first derivative. All right, so we've gone through the work now to find that first derivative. Given for this one, assuming we've already done the work to find the first derivative and simplify it correctly, given on this one is the second derivative, which we will now apply. The second derivative is 2 times the quantity x minus 2 all over the quantity 1 plus x raised to a power of 4. So using this as our second derivative, much like we did on the previous example, we're going to explore where the second derivative equals 0. And we're going to explore this time where the second derivative does not exist. We do that because we do have a denominator present in the second derivative. So on the second derivative equals 0 side, we're going to take our numerator of 2 times the quantity x minus 2, set that equal to 0. For the does not exist portion, we're going to take our denominator of 1 plus x as a quantity power to the 4, set that equal to 0. We solve each of these. We'll notice on the equal 0 side that we can divide a 2 out. There's no x attached there, so we can rule out that factor of 2, leaving us with x minus 2 equals 0, so x equals 2. As for the quantity over here for the does not exist side, well, basically, if everything's the fourth power and it equals 0, then 1 plus x would have to equal 0, meaning x would be negative 1. We set up our chart off the two values we found.
This time we would start at negative infinity. We would work our way up to the smaller value we found over here of negative 1. Pause at negative 1. Go from negative 1 up to the next value we found of 2. Pause at 2 and then go from 2 onward. As we consider the second derivative for the two values we found. Well at negative 1, negative 1 came from the does not exist portion, so the second derivative would not exist there. 2 came from the 0 side. Now if we consider our intervals we're working on and we pick numbers from those intervals, plug into our second derivative to see what kind of results we get back, what we should find is if we take a number that is less than negative 1 for that first interval and we plug into our second derivative, we should get a negative value back. Uh, likewise, if we take a value from negative 1 to 2, you know, something between those two numbers, say 0, if we plug that into our second derivative, we should also get a negative back. And finally, from 2 to infinity, something larger than 2, say 10, plug that into the second derivative, you should find, if you calculate that out, you get a positive value back. So what that means for the function it is concave down for the first two intervals, and it is concave up for the last. In terms of inflection points, now again, the inflection points we could potentially have would be where x is negative 1 and where x is 2. Now when x is negative 1, notice there's no change in concavity, so we're not going to have an inflection point at negative 1. As far as at 2 is concerned, well, we do have a change in concavity, so if we take 2 and we plug back into our original function, that would give us then our inflection point, our only inflection point for this problem. So plugging in, we should get 2 ninths back.